You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Welcome, friends. James Corbett here, CorbettReport.com, with another edition of Questions for Corbett, that ongoing podcast series in which you ask questions and I give answers. Uh, And it's been a while since our last one, so a few questions have accumulated in the email inbox and uh, the SpeakPipe inbox and on the website. So it's good to uh, clear that out and get some of these questions on the table and answered, I hope, in record time today. I don't think this is going to be a very long edition of Questions for Corbett, at least... It doesn't appear like it will be, but it always ends up being longer than I thought. And if you're watching the video version of this, you will forgive me for being surrounded by the accoutrement of my everyday life. But uh, sorry, Becca Lewis and uh, the other people out there of your ilk. (laughs) Yes, I do live in an actual home and this is my home and I don't have a studio to record from. So you'll just have to make do with the fact that I am an authentic human being. (laughs) If you don't know what I'm referring to, please go back to my recently released Propaganda Watch talking about the Mother Jones smear piece and uh, uh, the attendant data and society smear piece. Um, Under the title, Meet James Corbett, uh, Meet James Corbett, Political Extremist. Anyway, that'll be in the show notes, as will everything that we talk about in this edition of Questions for Corbett. And in case you are new to this program, then there are several ways to get in your question if you're interested in asking one. Of course, you can uh, contact me directly through the contact form on CorbettReport.com. I cannot and do not respond to everyone. In fact, I do not respond very much at all these days because I am overwhelmed by correspondence. So thank you for that. I do appreciate it. I try to read everything that comes in. I cannot respond to it all. But uh, if you want to send a question in that way, uh, you can certainly do so. You can also go to the contact form and there's a little uh, speak pipe application there where you can record your voice and that will be sent to me. So that can be played as an audio on future editions of this program. Or, of course, probably the best way to do it, log in if you are a Corbett Report member and leave your question in the co- comment section for this Questions for Corbett specifically. Sometimes I get Questions for Corbett in the comment section randomly scattered around, and by the time I go to record Questions for Corbett, I have no idea where the questions are. Keep them in the Questions for Corbett comment section, the most recent one, and I'll uh, take those questions into consideration. Uh, of course, video questions are also encouraged, but uh, not many of them. All right, so, uh, and on that note, please go to the Questions for Corbett uh, previous edition, uh, number 40, and that'll be linked up in the show notes. And you can see the questions and conversation happening last time. A great deal of conversation regarding uh, a couple of questions that we had at the very end of that podcast that I turned around to you guys, talking about alternatives to Windows and Apple OS X and Uh, There is a lot of discussion about Linux and other such things, so if you're interested in that, please go to the the comment section there. And also, some more back and forth with people asking questions and other people stepping in to answer them. Someone wanted to ask a a question about how I would restructure capitalism. (laughs) A great question, but have you got a spare couple hundred hours to talk about economics? I mean, not the kind of thing I could do justice to in a few minutes on a questions for Corbett, but there was some back and forth in there with some of the other Corporate Report members. So that's the type of thing I love to see, questions and responses, because of course this is interactive and uh, between you guys out there as well, not just me. I'm not some guru sitting on the clouds. But there are certain things I can answer, so let's go into the email inbox and start answering them. The first one is an email question in from Van who writes, In my high school biology and history classes, I remember being taught how eugenics was discredited. We conquered the Nazis, and so uh, so too this evil and false scientific idea of theirs. Of course, the eugenics idea is alive and uh, is an influential force today. We know there was hidden powers behind the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. Uh, You know when a guy fakes his death in movies so that he can elude his would-be killer? Do you think that motivation was thought out beforehand? All right, thank you for the question, Van. I follow very much what you're saying, and I think it's a great question, but maybe some people out there don't. Uh, If you don't know about eugenics at all, please do just type eugenics into the search bar of CorbettReport.com, and you will see some of the many podcasts, videos, documentaries, and other uh, pieces that I've done on it. Perhaps the most important, in a sense, being the how and why, specifically why Big Oil conquered the world, the first section of that deal, specifically with the eugenics movement, the idea... The, the term itself being <coughs> coined in the late 19th century by uh, Charles Darwin's 
cousin, Francis Galton, uh, and, and basically the idea being that the healthy and fit will pass on their genes, their good genes, to the next generation in order to improve the species, the human species, the human race, and uh, the lower stock will uh, unfortunately do breeding amongst themselves, and that will lead to dysgenics, the, 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 you know, the multiplication of the dirty people of the earth. And of course, ultimately, this turns out to be, surprise, surprise, a justification for why we are ruled over by rich uh, elite psychopaths is because they have the best genes that they deserve to rule over us. It becomes that kind of self-justifying kind of uh, ideology, as you would expect. Um, but the scientific, the pseudo-scientific kind of pursuit of eugenics, let's measure your skull and figure out, you know, how, how smart you really are and whether you deserve to, to be able to breed, uh, that, that side of it has been relegated to the past. And we now look at it as the historical, oh, that's, that's what eugenics was. And it was, yeah, it was a little bit distasteful. And we had these forced sterilization things that, oh, yeah, by the way, kind of started and really took place and took off in the United States. But, but no, it's mostly a Nazi master race thing. And the Nazis were killed in World War II, and then it's all over. Or so the official history goes. But as you know, the official history is always wrong, and it's wrong in this case as well. And that's what Van is alluding to. Could eugenics... Well, it, it is still ongoing, as I point out in Why Big Oil Conquered the World, just under different names and different forms, under different guises. But it is still very much an ideology that is fervently believed by many of the, uh, the powers that shouldn't be. So did they fake their own death, so to speak? Oh, eugenics went away with the Nazis. It's over. You know, that's, that's World War II kind of stuff. And it's gone. No, of course. Um, the, the answer, quite simply is yes, they did do precisely that maneuver. And we don't have to speculate about that. We don't even have to think about it. It is in their own documents that they specifically, and on the record and in black and white, said that they need to rehabilitate the name of eugenics. So we'll have to carry it on under other names. They specifically talked about this in numerous different contexts. And I did point to some of that in Why Big Oil Conquered the World. For example, the idea of uh, the founder of UNESCO talking in the founding document of UNESCO about how we need to rehabilitate the idea of eugenics. But I'll give you a very specific reference if you want the long story very short. In 1957, the person who was then the honorary secretary of the British Eugenic Society, the home base as it were, drafted a memorandum on the Eugenic Society's future, which he submitted at a special meeting of the Society's Council that year. And in it, he advocated a policy that he termed, quote-unquote, crypto-eugenics to carry on the dream of eugenics under another name, and literally under another name. Uh, in 1957, he submitted that proposal, and by 1960, it was uh, being taken very seriously. They were talking about it. They, they literally changed the name of the Eugenics Society to the Galton Society, and Eugenics Quarterly became Social Biology, and all of this. All, you so, see the literal renaming of all these eugenics institutions. They continue going forward, they continue doing the exact same work, but they get rid of the name eugenics, quite specifically. So that's, and of course I'll link the document talking about that, uh, that memorandum and the history of this so that you can read it for yourself. As always, as with everything, please go to the show notes. But yes, uh, that's the long story short. Yes, eugenics faked its own death, as, you, as, uh, as, as it were, and it still very much continues today under other guises. Uh, the short story long <laughs> is coming. You'll remember in the wake of Why Big Oil Conquered the World, I said there was going to be a series of follow-up podcasts. And we did have the follow-up podcast uh, 322, I believe, on what is sustainable development. And there was a follow-up podcast on data is the new oil. There's another follow-up podcast to Why Big Oil Conquered the World that is going to be specifically about crypto eugenics. And I haven't done that yet, but I need to do that. And I will do it shortly. So thank you for reminding me of that and prompting me in that direction. And that will be the short story long where there will be a lot more detail of precisely what that means and the implications and ramifications of that crypto eugenic movement. So thank you very much for bringing that up, Van. Let's move on to the next question. This one, another email coming in from... Weisik? Weisik? I'm sorry for mispronouncing this name or pseudonym or whatever it is. So anyway, I'll just say Weisik. Uh, he writes, uh, or she writes, it writes, your podcast 9-11 War Games is superb. I hope it will open the eyes of many. Keep doing the good work. One detail. You said that some pilots inexplicably squawked the hijack code. In a sense, yes. But the Korean pilot 
referring to KAL-85, was requested to squawk the code by the ATC, the air traffic controller, in Anchorage, who himself was ordered, in his own words, to request the pilot to squawk. He originally refused, but later complied. I might be confused here, but the Korean airliner, when requested to squawk, was already being escorted by the U.S. military jets on its way to Whitehorse, Canada. By squawking, he was making himself a legitimate target for the jets to shoot at. And he says, please watch this 12-minute video if you haven't seen it yet. And he includes the link to a video, which indeed I had not seen yet. So thank you for including that video. So um, thank you for the question and, and a little bit of clarification for people who are completely lost here. If you don't know at all what is being referred to here, please go and watch 9-11 War Games. CorbettReport.com slash 911 War Games, all one word, will get you to my latest podcast slash documentary about the war games that were taking place on 9-11. And I, I went through some of the the many anomalies and and phantoms and whatever else that uh, NORAD and NEEDS were tracking that morning, not just in the Northeast Air Defense Sector, but all throughout the continental United States and even uh, out into the, uh, the, the Pacific, in this case, with the Korean Airlines 85 coming into uh, Alaska, which was diverted to Whitehorse. And I said... Uh, specifically that, yes, I, I did talk about some of the planes inexplicably squawking hijack codes and things. Specifically with KAL-85, I said it inexplicably sent five separate and ongoing in indicators of a hijacking situation before being intercepted by NORAD fighters over Alaska and directed to land at Whitehorse in northern Canada to be shot down. And... As usual, those are not my words. Those are the exact words. Uh, five ongoing, and, uh, five separate and ongoing indicators of a hijacking situation is a direct quote from the Yukon government's own report into the incident, which I linked in the transcript. It is there in the transcript of 9-11 War Games, along with everything else. So let this be another reminder. Please, if you ever hear anything or see anything in any of my documentary work or, or podcasts, that you are intrigued by, please go to the show notes or the transcript and you will find the link that will take you to the direct link to the document. In this case, it is a Yukon government document into the incident where they talked about the five ongoing and separate indicators of a hijack that KAL-85 was giving, which doesn't necessarily um, include that hijack squawking, which, as Wysik says in his email, and as is followed up in this video that he links to, yes, that was actually something that the air traffic controllers, well, the air traffic controller was coordinating at that time with KAL-85, was ordered to order the jet to squawk the hijack code. What on earth? What on earth was going on there? Uh, to, to really wrap your head around just this tiny, tiny piece of the gigantic puzzle of 9-11, but an, a fascinating one nonetheless, uh, I would suggest you watch that full 12-minute video that Weissik links to, and which of course I'll put in the show notes, but let's just watch a little clip where the air traffic controller himself describes what was going on that morning. At some point, the, the passenger jet was squawking uh, a code in the 5000s, meaning that everything is status quo, or that's what it's supposed to mean. Mm -hmm. But at some point, you were given an order from FAA headquarters in Washington, D.C. that seemed quite strange. Talk about what happened then. Yeah, I've never had to issue a hijack squawk to an aircraft. I mean, we can issue an emergency code if we think the aircraft is having an issue. And it, what they do when they squawk, there's three particular codes that they can squawk, and it's uh, basically emergency radio failure hijack. And it actually tags up on other controller scopes, and also scopes down the lower 48, if like at the command center, uh, anybody, probably the military, I don't, can't really speak to how their equipment works, but it it just kind of tags them up a little bit differently. So it's a more pronounced target on the scope. So I've never had to do it before. I never had to do it after that. It was a strange request at the time. I never read it in the books where you had to do that. I'm, I've never, you know, we wouldn't necessarily ever issue that code to an aircraft because the way I look at it, it's not ours to issue, it's the pilot's to issue because it's a very serious code. So the 70 or the, the 7500 squawk was uh, the hijack code is um, 
was actually a supervisor came down and said we need to have the Korean Air squawk 7500 and I said well I didn't really think it was the right thing to do so they actually left and regrouped and talked about it and I had my opinions of why it wasn't but then later I was ordered to do it so and what were your thoughts why did you not want to do that we'd already had some miscommunication with the military that morning there'd already been some threats to shoot down some aircraft one that I was particularly working or probably others that happened to that if they didn't follow whatever uh, air traffic commands that we issued at the time that they would be shot down and I had one an aircraft that was just south of Anchorage on his way in he was told land at Anchorage and at the uh, 40 miles south of Anchorage, uh, I was told to turn him or they would be shot down. And I was realizing there was a lot of miscommunications with the civilian sector and the military sector. There were fighters with this Korean air and with the kind of communications that occur or breakdowns, we'd say occasionally that occur between the civilians and the military. My first thought and after I guess you'd say 19 years of experience, I knew how the military operates to an extent, and I thought, well, what if the guy's trigger happy? That's not a bad thing. You know, that's their job, and that's not my job, is to destroy aircraft with that series. And if they saw this code, I was afraid that it would, well, I was very afraid. I was more than afraid. It was probably the worst thing I ever had to do in my life to issue the code. All right. I don't know what that means any more than any of you do, or any more than the air traffic controller himself does. It was completely, not just out of the order, ordinary, but completely unheard of, completely nothing like this he has ever encountered, and there's no re regulation for this, to squawk, to make a pilot squawk a hijack code to indicate they have been hijacked while they are being escorted by military fighters who would then see that plane as a potential target. I mean, again, who knows what what was going on. And he goes into a little bit of who was ordering this, and he knows who ordered him to give that, but he doesn't know who ordered that person to give the order to him, and all of this. I mean, again, craziness, utter craziness. And this is just one tiny, tiny side event of 9-11, but again, points to the incredible, at the very least, confusion of that morning and the potential that there were live hijacking exercises and other things going on that the people involved in them didn't even necessarily know about. That's certainly an option on the table. Again, if you haven't seen it yet, corporatereport.com slash 9-11 war games. All right, uh, let's move on to a speak pipe uh, audio question, this time in from Josh. Hi, James. Question, there's a website CELDF.org. It's Community Environmental Legal Defense Fund, which he goes on to explain uh, about the Constitution, how it really works to protect corporations and how corporations have more rights than humans because they're persons. Of course, we all know this now, but he's using uh, community local rights to ban these corporations or teaching communities how to do this. So if a pig, like if a massive pig farm wants to move in, um, and you say no, the community says no, or the town says no, then the corporation can legally sue them, um, even for damages of profit losses, uh, and win every time because they have more rights according to the Constitution, which all seems great, conspiracy related, whatnot. But this is a 501c3, and it's using the rights of nature. Uh, basically argument where you literally have like the name of a river versus this corporation um, lawsuit, whatever. It's like an hour and a half presentation I saw on YouTube. It seems very interesting and informative and almost good, but it's a 501c3 and it seems like Agenda 21 or the rights of nature would eventually be used against us. So I was wondering if you've ever covered this I, I haven't found it, and will you look into this? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Josh. And in short, yes. Yes, I have talked about this, or more specifically, myself and James Evan Pilato uh, have talked about this in a New World next week, where we talked about, about a New York court which was going to rule on an argument that was being put forward by the Non-Human Rights Project that chimps should be treated as persons under the law with legal rights. And spoiler, although obviously we didn't know it at the time as those events were ongoing, but eventually the court ruled that no, they don't 
count as people with, with legal rights. Um, and I think you are right to be at the very least suspicious of this concept of humans, of course, people, claiming to speak on the behalf of chimps or rivers or uh, inanimate objects. Uh, potentially, at some point, a tree. I mean, I don't know where this where this stops, but I think you're right to be suspicious of this concept and how it is wielded. Even if it, uh, even if some of the the effects in some some of the test cases, even if that's something that we want or think we want. Well, yes, we want to keep these corporations out or whatever. But the implications of this are quite chilling, as I detailed in that edition of New World Next Week. This is obviously a glimpse of something that's uh, that's going to be coming at us a lot in a lot larger way in the future. But I think it's another example of one of those stories where the kind of basic underlying idea of it is something that appeals to people. Well, we, you know, non psychopaths generally would say yes, we should treat animals more humanely, more with more respect. Uh, we shouldn't, you know, treat them to in in torturous ways or whatever, just you know, for our own kicks. <laughs> And everyone has that underlying sense. They don't want to be cruel to animals. But uh, now trying to encode that in courtrooms, in the law, I mean, clearly this can go very bad very quickly when people start representing the animal sphere in the courtroom. And uh, who gets to speak for the animals and in what way and how will that be applied? And, and then is that lowering the human rights status of humans and things like this. So um, I think when we start to bring in the court sphere of it, I think we should all be skeptical, even if, I mean, it, look, I have nothing against people who are for animal uh, better treatment, but I think doing it in the courtroom is not the right way. And it's going to be used against us as a weapon, as pretty much everything else that are, that goes into that sphere of criminal justice ultimately does. So, yes, I, I, I'll restate it here. I believe that things like this are designed to play on the natural inclinations many people have, the natural tendency that we have to want to protect the earth and protect uh, wildlife and things like that that most non-psychopaths have. Uh, that those, those feelings and those intuitions are played upon uh, for uh, agendas that can be ulterior. And on that note, as for this website that you mentioned specifically, celdf.org, I have not looked into them specifically at this point. I have not done a deep dive or done deep research on this. So I'm very interested in hearing more about this because this is very much in line with the Agenda 21, Agenda 2030, whatever they're calling it this week, um, idea uh, on a couple of notes. For example, I note that uh, like the UN pushed global cities idea that we're not going to do any of this through, you know, national governments and treaties and all of that, which requires parliaments or, or you know, Congress or presidents to, you know, sign legislation or whatever that is. No, we'll just do it through agreements signed by mayors of major cities and, and then smaller cities sign on to it. And then you have this thing that isn't exactly a legal entity of any sort, but it's just this conglomeration of cities that have agreed to this. That's a, a UN idea. And I see that's how they are pushing. The CELDF organization is pushing this rights of nature legislation uh, specifically at the municipal level and at uh, at lower sort of rungs of the ladder so that it's going flying very much under the radar. Um, and there's a lot to look into in with regards to not just this site, but the idea generally. So I hope there are some in intrepid Corbett reporters out there who are willing to go down that rabbit hole and do the deep dive and see what they find and report back. I'm always interested to hear about that type of thing because I do want to uh, report on this type of topic in the future. Again, I, I don't know about the CELDF organization at this point in particular, but I'm interested to hear what other people can find. Um, and for those who need the bigger overview of this, because again, it always sounds like, oh, you don't care about the earth if, you, if you're against this idea or something like that. People often don't understand how it is the, the big corporations and the monopolists who steer this, in, these environmental movements towards what they want, which is the monopolization of all of the Earth's resources. And how do you do that? Well, actually, they do have a plan for this, and it is being implemented as we speak. And if you don't know about that, that plan, how it's being implemented, what it really means, and why these let's save nature by 
piling on board with these organizations stocked up with oil barons and all of these things. It's just, it's insanity if you actually d delve into it, but most people will only look at the front of, oh, it's, it's a World Wildlife Federation. It must be good. <laughs> so uh, if people don't understand that and don't understand the specifics of that, please do look into the aforementioned episode 322 on what is sustainable development, where myself, and perhaps more importantly in this case, Patrick Wood, the author of Technocracy Rising, goes into the nitty gritty details of how this is being accomplished and how the environmental movement and our natural inclination to want to protect the environment is being, being steered and being used to further a monopolist agenda, monopolizing the world's resources into the hands of a very few. Um, we'll have to leave it there for now, but please do look at episode 322 if you haven't yet done so. Let's turn to uh, back to the e e email inbox, and we have a question from Azra who writes, you mentioned this type of technology before, referring specifically to deep fakes, which I have discussed a couple of times, first in New World Next Week, uh, and then in a follow-up video that I did called Don't Believe Your Lying Eyes. And he says, uh, you, you mentioned this type of technology before and discussed the bad consequences of such technology. I think that you're right that such things can be used by powers that shouldn't be to make us not trust anything that exposes them if someone takes footage of politicians or something like that. But I think that one perhaps unintended consequence for the creators of this tech is that people will have to become more critical and won't be able to trust anything that is said by an authority since it might be faked. Instead, what is said has to be examined regardless of who says, uh, says it. What do you think? Uh, yes. Yes, you're 100% right. So for, again, for people who are completely lost, this is referring to the concept of deep fakes, which is this quote-unquote new, but not really, it's actually decades old, but this new technology, at least new to the masses who are getting their hands on it for the first time, that can uh, take, um, can basically effectively fake footage of people doing and saying things. And there are different iterations of this, and as I say, the Hollywood and others have had access to the deeper technology here for decades, and that's what I go into in that Don't Believe Your Lying Eyes video. Um, but uh, the idea is, well, as, as we pointed out at the time, um, they, uh, the powers that shouldn't be, uh, make us not trust anything that exposes them if someone takes footage of politicians or something like that. So the idea being that the politicians could come out and say, oh yeah, you might have, <laughs> you might have footage of me smoking crack like, uh, the, the Mayor Ford in Toronto or whatever, but that's not me. That was a fake. I mean, that, I'm sure that that will enter into the discourse in the very near future and will become a standard go-to for all sorts of things. And hey, it, it, it's true. In this case, you can't necessarily believe it, even when you see footage of something. Um, so, I mean, it does raise those questions. And also, the, 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 the corollary, corollary, the corollary of that is that that means that, that we should not trust any. At, at any rate, we have to think critically and examine critically any piece of evidence like that that's presented to us and think, well, this could be faked or manipulated. Do we, can we cross-reference cross this with other data that puts this into a context that makes it more believable? Or are there signs of manipulation or blah, blah, blah. I mean, there's lots of different ways you go from there, but it should be something that factors into our thinking at all times. Well, I saw this footage of this person supposedly doing something. Does that prove that thing to me? And, you know, how much time and effort am I willing to invest to to uh, say that that's uh, been proven to me to, to uh, an adequate degree and all of that. Well, yes, that, those are the types of equations that should be going through our head at this point. But will it? I mean, will this actually spur people into more critical thinking? Um, one could certainly hope, but uh, that is aspirational at this point. And that's why myself and James M. Pilato have been preaching for years that one of the most important skills we are going to be teaching our children, or even ourselves, really, come to think of it, is media literacy. And media literacy doesn't mean what it did 50 years ago. You know, how to read a newspaper critically or how to watch television critically. Now it means how to consume all this new media critically, whether it be memes or deep fakes or whatever, all these different things that are coming into, into play right now. So, yes, media literacy should be front and center, and things like deep fakes should bring that to the forefront of conversation. But I don't know about you. <laughs> I haven't had these kinds of conversations with any normie friends <laughs> at this point, anyway. Uh, we'll have to see when it starts to really get into the popular consciousness that, oh, that might be fake footage, and how they bring that to our attention through the controlled corporate media. 
But hey, as I, as I said recently on New World Next Week, I, I, I don't follow the controlled corporate media except to examine it for propaganda. So I, I, maybe I'll miss their rollout of that, uh, that particular campaign. All right. Um, let's go back to the email inbox. Uh, this time in for a, a question from Roger, who writes, Why does Saudi Arabia see Yemen as so much of a threat that, is willing to, that it is willing to bomb it into oblivion? Okay, excellent question, Roger. And if uh, you have an hour, <laughs> I could explain it to you. Actually, better than me explaining it to you, I will just direct you to a very thorough conversation on this very topic that recently took place between Ernie Hancock and Scott Horton on uh, Ernie's Declare Your Independence radio program, where they talk about this at great length. And of course, Scott Horton, as I'm sure many of my listeners know, has, follows this and has all of the details of, you know, this, this, uh, this person was in power and got taken out by this and all of those kinds of historical details. But what's, what's even better about this conversation is not only do you get that, but you get Ernie constantly drilling down with Scott. Why? Yeah, but why? Yeah, but why? No, what's the real reason here? And they keep hammering at that question until we get it a little bit more of a fundamental answer, I think. So uh, I, won't, I won't belabor it again. Just go and listen to that conversation if you're interested in that, uh, in that topic, which I hope we all are. Uh, let's move on. Again, let's go back to the SpeakPipe application for another audio question. This one in from Alex. Hello, James. This is Alex um, contacting you from the currently sunny climes of the northeastern United States, which will not be so sunny in very short order. Um, my question slash request is for some comment to be made on Iran-Contra and some indexing of all your previous um, episodes that deal with such um, and how they interweave with Gary Webb's investigation and Mina, Arkansas and and so on and so forth um a new episode or documentary which i'm sure would take an unbelievable amount of time i know how busy you are and i know how dedicated you are to making a quality product but um thank you very much and uh i hope to hear from you keep up the good work thank you for the question alex obviously an important topic but uh, no no such index exists exactly um as you indicate there i think in your question the iran contra affair does connect in many different ways to a lot of different players and concepts and ideas. So I'm not sure how much of an index is possible, but at least on the sort of main points that you touched on there, you're going to want to listen to episode 102 of the podcast, Know Your History, Iran-Contra. You're going to want to listen to episode 117 17 of the podcast, Requiem for the Suicided, Gary Webb. You're going to want to listen to uh, or watch a video report that I did on the CIA and the drug trade and the follow-up podcast to that episode 204 on, 204 on a brief history of CIA drug running. And that would be kind of the basics of what you're talking about there. The Iran-Contra affair and Gary Webb and CIA and drugs. That. Um, and there are different pieces of this that go throughout different things that I've done. I mean, for example, Admiral... Admiral Poindexter, uh, was one of the people convicted, ultimately, of Iran-Contra and obviously pardoned, but uh, went on to head DARPA during the time that they were bringing in the Information Awareness Office with its all-seeing eye in the pyramid logo that I've talked about many times. So, so there, again, there was lots of threads and characters that run throughout this saga. So you're exactly right that it is fascinating, it's exceptionally important to understand this and to connect all these threads, and yes, a, a documentary encompassing this and really telling the story and really connecting those threads in a clear, documented, concise way certainly is in order. And if you have a couple of spare years in your back pocket that you can lend me, uh, I would be happy to do that at this point, obviously. I just, yeah, I'll, I certainly will take that into consideration, but it is not on the front burner of projects that I'm working on. I do have projects that I'm working on, some of the bigger kind of projects that I do here, and that is not one of them, at least at this time. I think it does need to be done. Man, it would be great if someone out there stepped up and made a documentary like that. It would be very interesting, and I'd like to see it. I'm sure many of the people out there would, too. Um, but as I say, I'll, I'll definitely put it on the list. <laughs> the incredibly growing list of things to do. All right, uh, let's turn back to the email uh, bag for a question from Michael, who writes, I was wondering if you could make your videos available directly for download on your site. 
It's getting increasingly difficult to access your videos on YouTube. I'm not going to sign in on any of the Fang companies to leave a trail behind. Excellent. Yes. Yes, absolutely. 100%. I agree. You shouldn't be signing in. I'm glad you're trying to at least uh, wean yourself off of YouTube. And Michael, you are in luck. All of my videos are available to download directly from my server. You don't have to sign in to anything, not even my site. You just go to my site and download the MP4 directly to your hard drive. You can watch it yourself. You can subscribe to my podcast, my video podcast feed, and get the videos delivered directly to your podcatcher of choice. Uh, or either, if you'd prefer to stream it from a different service, not YouTube, I do BitChute and YouTube as well. So how do you do this? Well, it's not... I like to think it's not difficult. <laughs> I like to think it's not difficult. On CorbettReport.com, and Brock is going to show this on the screen right now. On CorbettReport.com, you have the banner. And just below that, you have a little menu bar. And one of the items on the menu bar, and you should check out that menu bar. There's some important links there. But one of the items there is videos. And if you click on that, it will take you to the video tab where you will see all of the videos that are on the site. All of the videos that get posted to the site are posted there. And if you click into one of those videos, you will get to the screen where you can download the MP4 or play it directly in the player there. And there will be links to the other ways that you can watch that on DTube or BitChute or, or YouTube if you prefer. So there you go. That's, that's the simplest way to do this. And uh, there are different things about the way that I post things. And when I post an audio that has an accompanying, accompanying video, it's usually the video is posted. The deep the downloadable MP4 is posted 24 hours later and blah, blah, blah. But long story short, ultimately all the videos end up on the video tab. And uh, you can search them either in the drop down list that is at the top of that videos tab once you click into it, or you can, uh, you can search for a specific topic or a specific video by title or whatever in the search bar of CorbettReport.com. Again, I don't think this is really difficult, but it just, <laughs> I know most people don't go to the site. Most people don't know how to use the site, so it might be difficult. But again, we're well, showing it on screen. If you're listening to the audio of this, go watch the video of it or download the video of this so that you can watch it uh, anytime. Uh, anyway, so yes, long story short, yes, don't worry, all of the videos are available for download from my servers, and yes, I do that intentionally because, as I say over and over and over again, one day I'm going to be censored from YouTube. It's gonna happen. You know it. You see it happening in slow motion. At the very least, the soft censorship is starting, as I talked about recently on Propaganda Watch, so we know it's coming. So I just want you to keep that in mind. And again, when my voice is silenced from YouTube, I will not be gone altogether. Until they get Corbett Report and BitChute and DTube and all the other ways, they won't get me off of the internet entirely. So I will be out there. You'll just have to maybe click an extra button to go find me on my site. All right, um, and finally, let's go to an email question from Seth, who writes, Hi, James. I was wondering if you know about a different proxy YouTube viewer besides HookTube, because I heard that they recently changed such that one could no longer view videos through them and not give the views to those videos on YouTube. I'm aware that there are many proxy videos, uh, proxy viewers, but not one specifically providing this perk. Okay. Excellent. Thank you for the question, Seth. This is an important question because I only very recently introduced HookTube to my audience uh, in, I think, the first edition of Propaganda Watch. I did make a point of watching that Kia propaganda commercial in HookTube, so I wasn't giving views to Kia's propaganda. Um, however, yes, uh, I think it was just a few months ago, maybe a couple of months ago, HookTube changed so that they no longer offer a proxy viewer, so you're not connecting to YouTube. Now they it's a direct YouTube viewer, so you are watching a YouTube video just on a different site now with HookTube. It kind of eliminates half the point of using HookTube, if not more. So, uh, and that was done for legal reasons, because obviously YouTube is not happy if you provide a proxy through which people can anonymously watch the content or get around the ads, of course, or anything of that sort. So, uh, anyway, for legal reasons, HookTube apparently caved and now no longer is uh, a proxy viewer. I have heard tell, and I, I will link in the show notes, a post that was made to Reddit recently about a beta test of a similar um, viewer that is purporting to provide that service of proxy viewing, however long that remains. And if, uh, let me turn this around as is our want here on the questions for corporate at the end of the program, I'll turn around a question for you. So if you know a proxy viewer for YouTube, 
or a way to view those YouTube videos without giving the videos views or without giving your information to YouTube or without seeing the ads, let us know. Um, that I'm very much interested myself because uh, I was linking, I was trying to link all of the YouTube videos that I would link in show notes and things to Hooktube, but at this point it doesn't matter because Hooktube is basically YouTube uh, on, a, on a different website. So. so anyway, it's a good question and I thank you for bringing it to me. And you know what? That's it. I think we're going to stop there. I, <laughs> I have a feeling this isn't going to be the 30-minute uh, podcast that I was hoping it was going to be. It's, it's a bit longer than that, isn't it? Oh, well. Well, I did my best. Anyway, that's going to do it for this time. Uh, again, I'm looking forward to your questions for next time. And as always, please do stay tuned to all of the feeds at corporatereport.com so that you can keep up with all of the different podcasts and interviews and videos and articles that are spilling forth from there on a nearly daily basis. And on that note, I'm looking forward to talking to you again in the near future. Thank you for tuning in. The Corbett Report presents Laughing at Tyrants, the latest DVD from the producer of... On the morning of September 11th, 2001, 19 men armed with box cutters directed by a man on dialysis in a cave fortress halfway around the world... And... Well, today on the How To Podcast, we tell you how to foil your own terror plot. And... But that's called the death panel, uh, and you're not supposed to have that discussion. Shut up, conspiracy theorist. Twelve of the funniest Corbett Report videos on one video DVD. Buy one for yourself or share it with a friend. Because the best way to disarm a dictator is to laugh at him. Buy your copy today at corbettreport.com slash shop.